Hello, this is Sanat here, and welcome back to the Soundcast, episode 19. Uh, today I was going to talk about uh, Kamen Rider Heisei Generations, as well as Dobut Sentai Juojo vs. Ninja, but I just didn't have the time to watch both those movies on top of this week's shows, on top of the other things I was doing this week. Um, a lot of it involved playing Injustice too, but uh, that's the thing is that the movies got subbed this week, and I like to do this week in Toku is, here's what got subbed this week, I just ran out of time. Um, and I want to hit my deadline for the Soundcast uh, every Friday evening, so we'll be talking about those next week. They'll probably be the bulk of the first half of the show, um, and then still do the regular episode reviews on top of that. So that should be a fun time, uh, definitely. This week I did want to talk about uh, just life in general. What's life like for me? Well, uh, let's talk about how toy collecting can be so stressful and why it doesn't need to be. Uh, Toy collecting is a fun hobby. You're collecting toys, so naturally it is fun. Um, But it can be very stressful sometimes. And I'm not just talking about like, oh, I don't have enough money to afford these toys each month. That's that's not it. Um, Sometimes you have the money and then you just can't buy it. And that is the worst feeling. Um, Or something is extremely limited and it's impossible to get. It's this kind of uh, thing that happens lately. Um, Let's let's, let's break it down. 2017 has been kind of a hectic year for a lot of things. But in the realm of toy collecting, um, it seemed like all the companies took January, February, and March off. And then between April and May just put out all their product they would have put out three months ago. Um, And then they're being quiet for June and July, and then we just get, like, a ton of stuff in August. Um, It's it's kind of, like, it's really uh, frustrating with the way that retail distribution works these days uh, to where a wave of of Marvel Legends, say, like, the Sandman wave, is popping up, it started popping up in my area in mid-April when online retailers had it back in January, I think. Um, I eventually got fed up and just ordered the case off Big Bad Toy Store, um, in order to get them, because I was like, oh, I, I want Sandman, um, but it, it, it was very frustrating, I was like, I can't find these in stores, what the heck, um, and so it was just like, kind of a frustrating experience, um, and then recently with the Warlock Wave Marvel Legends, uh, for the longest time, it was like, oh, here it is on online retailers, and there's like no in-store sightings, and Cyclops and Colossus are going for like $45, $50 a piece on the secondary market, And I'm like, geez, this is insane. Why is this wave nowhere to be found? And then now I'm finding it everywhere, except for Cyclops and Colossus. Um, So it's not working out. But yeah, that wave, it's like so delayed, especially with Marvel Legends lately, it's so delayed from when the online retailers get them to when the physical retailers get them. And it's kind of a thing Hasbro's been doing lately, it seems, because Transformers is the same way. Um, And so it, it stuff just piles up that way. If stores wait till they have a reset to put on a new wave of figures, that's just going to pile everything up, um, which I think is not good uh, for retailers or for collectors. It kind of makes it really stressful because you're like, oh, oh, dang, that's a lot of stuff at once. Um, DC Multiverse is a similar situation where they start popping up online and they start popping up in stores of conveniently after I got everything from the King Shark wave on Amazon, except for Hawkman, who I actually found in store. Um, and now I'm starting to see the figures everywhere, and I like even saw a Zoom in store. So I was like, oh, great. So we're doing good there. Things are getting better. Um, and in three months, they could be everywhere, and I literally stressed about it for nothing. Uh, but it's sometimes hard to say, because you don't know how things are going to play out in the retail market. And then it's also uncertain how things will play out on the secondary market. So for example, let me just give an example here. Um, If I was collecting Marvel Legends, and I was like, oh, the Pizza Spider-Man figure will be around for a while. They're going to produce a bunch of him. I'll never have to worry about getting him. I can wait to get him later. Well, you wait, and he sells out, and then he never comes back. And you're like, oh, well, I really wanted that, but I can't now because it's gone. And then the aftermarket price, you can get one uh, loose for like $45 without a -a Build-A-Figure part. And then suddenly it's like, oh oh crap, I screwed up, I didn't get this figure, and now I I don't want to spend $45 on this two- to three-year-old figure now. And that's where toy collecting gets really insane. And I think that's kind of like the thing that 
that because it's such a heavy collector's market now for, for toys, it's not so much kids are buying toys as much as collectors are. Um, and especially with things like six inch collector based series, it becomes a very stressful experience because there's a lot of uncertainty of what will be uh, rare on the aftermarket and what will not be, um, or if things will ever hit retail. Uh, there was well, the Abomination Wave Marvel Legends, which was an abomination of itself. Um, I barely saw that at retail. I got like I ended up uh, getting the figures on Amazon super cheap because they're like less than ten bucks a piece because nobody was wanting them. But that wave just never hit retail. Um, and Transformers, I, I've there's been a few Transformers where I'm like, well, when is the wave that's gonna like not hit stores? And right now it's the Perceptor uh, wave, the wave of Perceptor top spin cup croc and quake where is it i don't know i haven't seen it in stores um i got my top spin and perceptor off toysrose.com but i haven't seen any of them in stores um i would totally pick up croc if i could find them uh, just by himself but yeah it's uh it's kind of like well well what what is going on with the distribution here um and for what i'm seeing as well is like i have targets that don't have deluxe titans return figures and yet they're not ordering anymore. There's no new stock. And I'm like, there's current waves. It's not like the line is dead. Where is the stock? Um, it's kind of a weird experience. It's a very weird time, but it's also, it's a good time for a lot of reasons, but it's also a bad time for a lot of reasons. I think that retailers are getting concerned with uh, older stock building up. But then I go into Walmart and I see Marvel Legends from the Odin wave still. Still full price. And I'm like, guys, you got to clearance this out return to the manufacturer for credit or something. But I think it's also a case of, I don't think that um, with, with several stores that they're keeping a good inventory of how long something's been there. Um, especially since stores like Walmart and Target use the same uh, SKU or DCPI number for an entire line. So it's Marvel Legends six inch figure. And so that means a figure from 2015 or 2014 could still be on shelves, and nobody's going to like clearance it or anything unless there's a clearance on all Marvel Legends, um, which I think is a problem, because without that specification of waves, or even years, if it was like, oh, 2017 Marvel Legends, I think it would work out better, because then the new stock would be able to come in, because it'd be like, oh, this is the 2015 wave, um, let's start clearancing out the Misty Knights now. Um, <laughs> or there was a weird case where a lot of targets just suddenly got restocked, so the 2014 Guardians of the Galaxy movie wave, uh, which I don't understand what happened there. That was a weird situation that never got explained. But every target I have, I've gone to now has something from the Groot wave. Um, but yeah, it's like it's kind of a strange time. And the same with D DC Multiverse. I go to my Walmart and I see that they have like a couple armored Batman, maybe a Lex Luthor or a mutant leader on the peg. There's a ton of shelf space. Where's the Wonder Woman movie figures? They got all the other Wonder Woman toys. Where's the Wonder Woman movie figures? Where's the King Shark wave? Um, what happened to the Super Friends Walmart exclusive figures that have only appeared in Canada, which makes them now a regional exclusive, um, I guess, because they just haven't appeared in America. There's a whole wave of Walmart exclusives that was shown at a Comic-Con. Haven't seen the surf, but it haven't surfaced yet. Um... Toys R Us is doing pretty good with DC Multiverse. I walked in, saw the King Shark wave, alongside odd restocks of the New 52 Doomsday wave, but I hadn't seen it there before. Um, they had the Wonder Woman movie figures, and Toys R Us has two exclusive figures that they stocked online that lasted pretty pretty good. Um, they have the retail release exclusive for Manelope, who's also available on Amazon and Mattel Shop, so that's a pretty nice uh, option there, so that way you're not having to go through exactly one store. Um, I think the shared exclusive thing is a good idea. And then the Damian Wayne Robin was in stock for a good two days, I think, um, which was pretty impressive since that's the other side of toy collecting with exclusives. Um, for example, if there was an exclusive that people really want, it's going to sell out. Like the Groot Evolution set, gone instantly. Um, but yeah, it's like store exclusives can be really stressful as well, on top of just trying to get new retail figures, mass retail figures. Um, for example, uh, the Marvel Legends for Wal Walgreens exclusive Marvel Legends I, I can find. Punisher, Namor, um, I even saw Black Ant the other day. Plenty of quantities of those. 
uh, when Brainstorm came out, I was able to find him pretty quickly, but I haven't seen him since. Um, and then with the Marvel Legends or the Star Wars Black series Walgreens exclusives, I once saw the Emperor's Wrath Vader, never saw Prototype Boba Fett, and only once saw C-3PO, and that was when I bought it. Um, it it's like, and I think Walgreens is a weird trend that's going on right now, is that they're trying to expand their toy department. But I feel like that's like a corporate thing where like, oh, we want to start like adding more collector focused toys to our, our stores. But then they just don't tell the like the the baseline retail people. Cause around here, in my area, they got like the little like, here's like our four Marvel Legend Namors. Here's a stack of pop vinyls. And maybe you got a couple DC multiverse in here. But like there's not a whole lot. And their transformers um are just wave two. Um I think the biggest problem with the brainstorm for Transformers was that a, it was a main headmaster, so that was poor character choice. Uh, B, it was shipping in a case with Wave 2 Titans Return Deluxes um, at Walgreens where things cost more. And it's just, at least here around my area, it's more expensive to buy things at Walgreens than as other retailers. Um, so if I see something that's like I see at other retailers, I'm not going to pick it up at Walgreens. I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, but if they have an exclusive, then I'll buy it from them. Um but because Brainstorm was shipping in cases of Wave 2 instead of just shipping as a solid case of 8 or whatever, um, I think that kind of hurt his availability. And I wonder if the same thing happened with the Star Wars figures because they made freaking C-3PO a Walgreens exclusive. The standard original trilogy C-3PO, which that was like the biggest head scratcher there. And then secondly, it was just impossible to find. Um, so... When it comes to toy collecting, it can be a fun hobby, but also be really frustrating. Um, sometimes why I think I kind of like to follow Japanese toy collecting a little bit, because it's a lot simpler than American toy collecting. In American toy collecting, you have to deal with a retail market. Um, you have to deal with, oh, you know, Zoom will be available on Amazon for like two seconds, and if you didn't order it, then it's gone, and the price is tripled suddenly. Um, which is what I just kept having to do, that one-click buy thing. Um, and eventually, I got my... I got... Colossus um, from Marvel Legends, and I got I found a Cyclops in store actually, and I got the entire DC Multiverse King Shark Wave, but they were all like quick, quick grabs. Um, just as soon as I saw it up, I just hit buy it now. But then sometimes like the one click buy option would just kick you out with, um, you know, we don't have the quantities available. So it's kind of like a, a very hard situation to to, de to deal with, um, and that's that's just toy collecting in general these days. Uh, it's it's not like it's not like it used to be, and I think that I, I wish that the companies producing them would have better options for getting them or produce more quantities. Uh, something that I think that would be very beneficial to say Hasbro or Mattel, um, since they both have Hasbro Toy Shop, offer more of the retail figures available, but like just have a set amount of stock that's just like, hey, this is for our site. Um, so collectors can kind of go there and maybe even announce when they're going up saying, hey, we got quantities of DC Multiverse Zoom going up at Mattel shop on Wednesday at 10 a.m. And then people can plan it out and people can go 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 try to get them. Or, um, you know, we're going to have restocks throughout the day. Amazon just puts stuff up whenever. Um, so it becomes kind of a mad dash. And then trying to find things at retail... Like, the thing is, you, you can probably, for most, like, Marvel Legends or DC Multiverse, I find that um, with King Shark Wave, you'll probably be able to find the Joker and Hawkman, because they're two per case. Um, you'll probably be able to find Jim Gordon, Batman, and Earth 2 Flash. But if you're looking for Batgirl or Zoom, and you didn't get there before somebody else did that wants them, then you're kind of you're kind of out of luck at that point. Um, I think with both Marvel Legends and DC Multiverse, they pack... Six to seven figures, six, seven, or eight figures a wave. I know Marvel Legends did an eight figure wave recently, um, which is really great because it's like, oh, that's a good chunk of figures. Um, with Marvel Legends, I wish they'd slow the pace a little bit because by the time I finish the Sandman wave, the the, um, the Sandman wave I just got finished, and already the Movie Vulture wave and the Guardians of the Galaxy Mantis wave are out, um, and I'm like, whoa pump the brakes a little bit because I just got through buying $180 worth of Marvel Legends. I got to recover that, you know, I got to recover a bit before you give me more. Luckily for me, um, 
I can skip Death's Head 2 and movie Vulture, movie Spider-Man, and movie Homemade Suit Spider-Man and Moon Knight, because I'm just not interested in any of them. Um, so I'm like looking at nine more figures, but that's still another $180. So who wins in this situation? Like it doesn't, there isn't a winning situation here. So um, I think that Marvel Legends is a line that needs to calm down. <laughs> and I think it's causing problems, I think, at the retail level as well, because they have characters like Shatterstar who aren't going to sell very well, um, I, I don't think personally. Um, and then DC Multiverse is, is at a fine pace, um, because like I think the next the Batman mech suit wave is scheduled for June through Big Bad Toy Store, but I haven't ever seen Multiverse stuff in stock at Big Bad Toy Store, at least recently, um, so I don't know how accurate that date is. Uh, but then we have a Clayface wave that's not scheduled till fall, and, you know, but the, the thing was, they did put out the Wonder Woman movie wave at the same time as the King Shark wave. If you're only collecting comic-based figures, you were in the clear, you just gotta figure out how to get the six King Shark parts. If you were collecting movie figures too, that's ten figures. That was, that was where I was at. I was like, I, I got, I got ten figures to buy. Um, and then they threw in more exclusives, and like, oh, it's, it's now twelve. Um, and then there's another Wonder Woman that hasn't come out yet, that's 13, if you include the two Super Friends figures that aren't out in America, that's 14 in, like, a two-month span. So, it's kind of nuts. Um, I do kind of miss the days where, like, for, for budgeting-wise, I miss the days where DC Multiverse shipped in two waves, where it was like, oh, here's three figures, and then a, a month or two later, here's the other three figures. That was kind of nice, it kind of spaced it out. I don't know why for the Doomsday Wave they did four and two. And then for King Shark, they're just like, ah, just throw all six together. And then for the mech suit Batman, they're like, ah, we're just going to do five instead. So, I don't know what's going on. Um, collecting American superhero figures, as well as collecting Japanese Sentai Mecha and uh, figure arts and such, it gets really taxing uh, on, on the budgeting uh, side of things. But also just, like, trying to keep up with everything. Because I've been talking about American toy collecting primarily through this. I could probably have a whole other segment about Japanese toy collecting and how that is madness with web exclusives and pre-orders going up and uh, HLJ stock problems. And I think that's going to be a subject for another day. I don't really want to talk more too much more about this, but I think when it comes to American retail uh, products, it's it's and I even talk anything about Power Rangers, and that is just a whole other can of worms. Because Power Rangers is the kind of thing where it's like, no online pre-orders. It's like, oh, so Cataclock and Snow Dyes are out, have fun. And I look at my stores, I'm like, oh, I, I just see the first couple waves. And I think something Bandai should stop doing is shipping any cases that are just the five Rangers without the villains. Just ship them with the villains. Just do that as one wave. Uh, because that is kind of clogging up my Toys R Us. And I don't think they can get more figures. And I really wish they would have done a wave of six for those deluxe armored figures because I've not seen the second wave because the first wave is not selling. And, yeah, Legacy is a different story, too. Um, I, I've not had too much trouble finding Legacy stuff, but at the same time, I can understand, like, if you're not if you're not there right when it comes out, it can get really stressful to try to pick it up. But hopefully things pick up with American Retail. GameStop's getting in the game of... Uh, getting collector series, so, you know, they're getting Star Wars, Black Series, DC Multiverse, Marvel Legends, um, they're getting more collector focus, it seems, for toys, um, as well as games, so, honestly, GameStop may be a better toy resource than it is a game resource, and hopefully Walmart and Target kind of shape up a little bit, I've not had problems with Toys R Us, and Walgreens, you gotta tell your other stores, that expand those toy sections, because right now, I'm not believing that you're trying to do a collector's toy focus push, it's just, it's not, you're not selling it yet. But, uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, let's move on to This Week in Toku. Welcome to This Week in Toku, the segment of the show where we talk about this week's tokusatsu series. That being said, it's whatever has been fan sub for the week, not what was aired this week. Because I record on Fridays, most toku shows air on Sundays in Japan, to Saturdays in America. Uh, also, Kyori Brave is on a one-week delay for subs, for fan subs, so we're going to be looking at the episode that got subbed this week. Um, like I said earlier in the show, we will be talking about Kamen Rider Heisei Generations and Juoja vs. Ninja next week after I've watched them and I can do full reviews of them. So let's talk about Uchu Sentai Q Ranger episode 14. Full spoilers, this episode was pretty much filler. 
uh, which was kind of nice. We haven't had a filler episode in about seven episodes, and I feel like in the midst of the plot, we don't get those neat character moments that I always like with Sentai. Um, I always feel like what, why I always feel more connected to Sentai characters than writer characters is because the plot just takes a break sometimes and we can get some nice focus on them. Um, we have gotten more character focus lately, which has been really nice in amidst the plot, and it kind of all ties together. This episode was a focus episode for Garu, and that's kind of interesting because really Garu got some focus in episode one, and we haven't seen a whole lot about him since. He kind of moves Lucky's plot forward from last week. Um, last week, the week before, two weeks ago, um, but, you know, I think it's, it's great for him to get some focus. Uh, also, it was just nice to have a goofball episode, because this show's about, you know, an evil organization, an empire, taking over the universe. It's nice to have a goofy episode. Um, this is all about, like, just this guy that likes fancy stuff. That's the whole monster's thing. Um, fancy and luxurious. Uh, so, it's kind of interesting because it, it's also neat because the Key Rangers had to infiltrate this zone. And it's also very apparent that all of Dark Matter does not know the Key Rangers' identities. It's kind of like something that you think about. It's like, oh, well, you know, that when they have pictures of them. It's like, no, well, most of the monsters that come in contact with them in their civilian forms end up getting killed. So, they never can actually, you know, track down who they are outside of just the Key Ranger suits or the Seiza Blasters. So... It was really neat. Uh, there was some fun stuff with Kyutama and Sholanpo just being silly. and It was just a goofy episode, and I really liked that. Um, but there was a subplot here, which was Garu is was getting unsure of himself because he wasn't getting picked at all uh, from the Q-Let chance. He was getting just sidelined all the time, and it, it kind of was getting to him. And I thought, that was, hey, that's a really great plot. Um because it's not something you think about in Sentai, like, oh, they're out there fighting, but it's like, do they have doubts about themselves? Are they self-conscious about things? And, yeah, I think it was kind of interesting. Um, also, this whole crisis of him having to cross-dress <laughs> using a Kyutama uh, was kind of funny because he basically confessed his love to Lucky a few episodes ago, so maybe he's just, maybe he's having trouble with his sexual orientation as well. I don't know. Maybe that's reading into it a little too much. Um... But I think that it was a great focus for Garu that let, you know, him shine. It let him shine a bit. Also, some great scenes with Balance and Naga um, while Lucky and Spada get to team up. And Hammy just literally left the show for most of the episode. Didn't even fight in a ranger suit this time. It was kind of strange. But yeah, I thought it was really neat um, just how this episode was done because it was the perfect example of a good Sentai filler episode to where it doesn't advance the plot but it develops a character and has a lot of fun doing it. That being said, not much else to say. Uh, it was nice to see Ryu Teo use different arms, in this case being a uh, Timbin Voyager and a Betsky Voyager, well, since Kotaro and Stinger are out of the show for now. And, yeah, I thought it was a really good episode overall, just as, as a standalone, here's a fun episode. Um, I'm really looking forward to next week, as Hammy did the... Uh, the episode preview, so it might actually focus on her, which would be nice for the same reason that, yeah, she got a little bit of focus here and there, but not a full episode to herself. Um, I'm kind of hoping that that's what we're going to be getting for, you know, the next little while while Stinger and <laughs> Stinger and Champ can go deal with the plot stuff, but just have the main key ranges get developed a little bit. And I think having less characters to focus on gives you a chance to kind of focus in and be like, hey, this is Garu's episode or this is Hammy's episode. Um, because anybody that was past the main five each got their own episode. I'm counting Balance and Naga as one being at this point. Um, but yeah, Show Lanpo got focus. Balance and Naga got focus. Um, Raptor 283 got focus. And Stinger got a ton of focus. Um, and then Lucky's gotten a bunch of focus. But then in terms of like Garu, Champ. Well, Champ's gotten more because of Stinger. Um, so Champ and Stinger kind of go together. Um, but yeah, like uh, Hammy... Spada and Garu hadn't gotten much focus, and I think that it'd be really nice to see, like, next week be Hammy and the week after be Spada. I don't know. Um, I think that if we're not going to be getting any new Mecha or any new uh, Rangers till July, let's take that time to develop the characters now um, and maybe advance the plot a little bit here and there. Also, for those curious, yes, we're actually getting off Earth next week, it seems like, because next week's title is, like, the Ocean Planet Verla or something like that. So, um, kind of looking forward to a little bit change of setting. Um, but yeah, 
overall, Key Ranger 14 was a solid episode. Uh, I know some people may not like it because it's like, you know, I think, honestly, I feel like the Toku community gets too wrapped up in, oh, there's going to be plot and drama and the plot has to move every single episode. And I think that it works for Ryder uh, to an extent, but it doesn't work for Sentai. Sentai is different. Sentai has always been different. And if you are going into watching Super Sentai, wanting it to be more like Kamen Rider, then please, for everybody's sake, stop watching Sentai. It's not for you. If you're trying to get Sentai to be more like Rider, then go watch Rider. And if you're out of Heisei Rider, go watch Showa Rider. Because Showa Kamen Rider is honestly better than Heisei Rider in a lot of ways. And a lot of people don't give it a chance. But that is just me. I personally think if you don't like a show, if you don't like a show to the point where you're complaining about it constantly on Twitter, I would recommend not watching it. Or if you're not going to watch, if you're going to watch it anyways, don't complain about it. Because if there's a show that everybody likes that you don't, and you're still watching it, and you're complaining about it, then that's just kind of, I think, a bad reflection on you. Because at that point, you should, you don't, don't watch something you don't enjoy. TV shows, movies, comics, video games, they're all entertainment. They're to make you feel better or to give you a deep story to think about. Um, film can be used as a medium where it can, like, you know, you can think deep about things. But for a show like Super Sentai or Kamen Rider or most toku, they're there to entertain you. And if you're not being entertained, then why bother? It's just, you're just wasting your time at that point because if you're not entertained by the entertainment content that is presented in a Super Sentai series, then don't watch the series. It's simple as that. It'll save you a lot of stress. Anyways, now that my um, my therapy corner is over, let's talk about Cure Uger Brave. Um, in an ironic twist of fate, Q Ranger did not have a very plot heavy episode, and Cure Uger Brave had a very plot heavy episode. In fact, we're starting to get the semblance of a story here, which I think is really nice. It's just been kind of the first four episodes have been setting up Rangers and conflicts and. Last week, we got the very good introduction of Dino uh, Gold Brave, who is a space mercenary who's fighting the Cure Ugers, and I was like, hey, this is cool. I'm mixing up my terms again. I'm so sorry. Everyone out there, Dino Force Brave and Cure Uger Brave are the same show with two different sets of terminology in two different languages, and I'm going to start mixing them up because I'm still thinking about Cure Ugers since it's a Cure Uger sequel, but I've been watching the Korean version so it's going to get mixed up, and I apologize for that if that confuses anybody. Um, yell at me in the comments if you like. Anyways, the point is, is that this episode, I think, finally started getting us to a plot, which is fine because the only other toy we haven't seen is Brigigas. Again, because we saw him at the beginning, but we haven't seen the Gigant Bragio. I don't know what his Korean name is. I'm sorry. Um, but we haven't seen that, so that'll debut at some point. But other than that, this is we got all the toys out of the way, basically. Uh, they introduced the five mecha. Um, they introduced the changer, sword. Uh, we already got Judenchi shown, and we got gold and his mecha and his changer and sword. So, naturally, now is the time to have a story. And basically what the story boils down to is that the uh, Dino Force Brave team, so I'm going to try to keep this consistent, Dino Force Brave, are looking at that each of them have their own strengths and weaknesses, and they need to work together with that in order to defeat Dino Bra Gold Brave. So, really cool. Uh, which kind of nice is that I think it's cool about Dino Gold Dino Dino Gold Brave is that he actually just stands up to the villains. He's like, "Hey, you guys have gone down there and just gotten your butts kicked several times. Why not pay me? And I'll take care of them for you." Um, and it's a really cool fight scene. I love how it starts out with a mecha fight. I think it was like a great way to do it. Um, we also have this nice scene where Dino uh, Gold Brave watched a couple of children help each other. Um, and that was reminding him of, of something in the past. Um, but I love how it starts out with a mecha fight. But I also like how the, the fight doesn't start till about four and a half minutes in. So, the new record, I think. We usually get fights a lot quicker in this show. Um, the mecha fight was great. We got another crazy CG mecha fight again. Um, which was kind of nuts. I... I don't know why they don't did that, but I don't know if I like it or not. Part of me is like, yeah, I like practical mecha fights all the time. But the other part of me is just like, dang, that's really cool and fast, and it's different, and I like it. 
but I don't know if I want to keep it, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's a weird situation. Um, I can't really say for sure um, what's up with that. Um, that being said, uh, they go and fight on the ground. Uh, interesting to note, this looks like the standard warehouse Toei uses to film in, uh, that they filmed a lot of stuff for Kira Ujirin, ironically. Um, this is like the warehouse they, they, they do a lot of fighting in. I know Paradox was fighting... Um, X aid in, in an episode once here, but what's interesting is that they transition um, between the in suit footage, which I think was filmed in Japan at the same Toei warehouse, uh, to footage of the um, Dino Force Brave civilian actors in the same warehouse almost. It, I can't tell if it's the same warehouse. So I'm like, the thing is, there's not a lot of behind the scenes information on this show. We know for Power Rangers that the cast goes to New Zealand. I don't know if the South Korean cast of Dino Force Brave goes to Japan to film some scenes. Because it's very consistent. Like, the, the thing is, outside of a couple editing quirks in the mecha fight, um, with some stock footage, they do a better job here of matching uh, new Korean footage with Japanese footage, I'm presuming, um, since we got set photos from in Japan. Um, it's matching very well. Better than Power Rangers ever has, I think. Um, location, either they're doing really good location matching, or they are filming fight scenes in Korea, and or taking the Korean actors to Japan. I'm not sure which is which. I'm thinking they probably are f filming more in Korea, and they film some stuff in Japan, but more stuff in Korea. Um, I know the mecha fights are filmed in Japan, because that's the same Toei uh, mecha lot <laughs> that they always use. Um, what's interesting about this... Uh, whole storyline is that at the end of all this fighting, we find out that Dino Gold Brave is uh, Dino Red Brave's older brother. And that's where they leave the episode. And I'm like, that's an amazing cliffhanger. But let's dance first. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because it seems like they're brothers and that was something neither of them knew. Uh, <laughs> which is interesting because they were fighting only the only, well, that's the thing, though, is that last episode, um, Dino Brave Red only fought him, Dino, he only fought gold, Red only fought gold when they were, they were morphed, or they'd changed into ranger form, um, they hadn't, they hadn't done that, um, they hadn't seen each other outside of the ranger suits until this fight, where they blasted each other and fell out, which is kind of nice, they start with the mecha fight, and then transition to the ground fight, but, that was kind of interesting. Um, definitely really cool that we actually have plot development. I thought this was just going to be toy pushing uh, with a little with some cool fight scenes, but we actually got some really cool stuff um, overall. So yeah, I'm I'm digging this show. I want to see more. Uh, I need to stop looking at premium Bandai pages because they're releasing everything now. Um, it's kind of scary. We got one thing that's a five part mecha set. Um, with the five main mecha. And now there's a set of the Gabu Gabu Revolver and the Gabu Gabu Caliber, as well as coming with all the new Judenshi, uh, 26 onward. 26 onward, 24 onward. 24 onward. Um, so all of those are included with the Changer and the Sword. Um, and now I'm kind of thinking they'll probably do a set of Gold Sword and Changer and a set with Gold's Mecha and Brigigus. So. It could get dangerous. Um, I'm just telling myself, don't pre or anything. Just wait till it comes out. Try to find it on the secondary market. You don't actually need it. It's a South Korean sequel to Kyori Ujur. It doesn't count towards your Sentai collection, technically. It, but if you get the Sentai released versions, it's technically that. But it doesn't count towards your Power Rangers Sword collection, which is important. I'm trying to get myself off of this, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. I just need to get a high-paying job so I can afford all these toys. Especially since I'm trying to collect Go Buster Mecha right now. <laughs> Anyways, so that's Kyori Ujir Brave. I'm really looking forward to the next episode. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see that today, since it is Friday. Um, so, Anyways, let's move along. Shifting gears to the other Tokusatsu series. Kamen Rider, starting with Kamen Rider x episode 31. Probably the most intriguing episode plot-wise we've had in a while. Um, things have been really, really interesting in x -Aid. Um I don't feel like I've... I think it's the same thing I've... I feel like I'm establishing a better connection character-wise with Q-Ranger, but the plot in x is so good that I'm liking the characters that are in it. Um, 
But things like the thing, the thing that Kamen Rider has an advantage of is that because of its popularity, we can have V cinemas and spinoffs. So you have like the Brave special that you know delves into Brave's character more, or the Snipe special that goes into his backstory, or you know apparently there's a laser one coming up, and there was a Gim special that. Wait, Gim's like the main plot of the show, so mm, was it really that different? <laughs> was it really more focused than usual? I don't know. Uh, point is, is that characters get extra focus beyond the main writer through those special side stories, um, which is something that, you know, they can spend more time in the show developing the plot and then do those side specials to develop the characters, which I think works. I mean, they've been doing a ton of side stuff for X-Aid, uh, which really helps with that. But overall, like, the main focus here is Emu and Parado, and they're the two main characters, but Gim is like that third character that just throws a wild card into everything. And last week, we got the revival of Kamen Rider Gim. Dan Kuroto is back. And now he's back, and he's going to be working with CR and the other uh, gamer writers. That's not the term. Ride players. That's not it either. Gamer... I don't actually know what that term is. The other x aid writers, basically. Um, what's interesting is since Dan Kuroto became a bugster, he's, like, really goofy now. Like, even goofier than, like, crazy evil Dan Kuroto from before he died. Um, but he he's such a dick. <laughs> like, it's just, that's how he, he is just such a jerk to everybody. He's like, oh, yeah, I built this whole system so everybody can come back to life after they die. It's a continue system. And then they're like, oh, you better atone for your sins and apologize. He's like, I don't know what I've done that I would apologize for. Everybody's like, you've killed people. You literally murdered one of our writers. Still miss Laser. Rest in peace, Laser. But you'll probably be back because this is how the show's going. Everybody's, everybody that's died in the show's come back. Graphite's back. Dan Crudo's back. If Kyria doesn't come back, I'm going to be so pissed. Um, anyways, so apparently, Clearing Counter Chronicle will bring back all the people that have died. So, that's convenient. Um, if that actually happens, because I don't exactly tra- trust uh, Dan Crudo that much. I think that he's still evil. He's still really evil. Um, but that being said, I think that the character is really well developed in that he had this whole arc. He died and was completely gone, but then now he's come back and he's trying to atone for his sins. And he's got 99 lives. So he, even though he's a level zero... He can stand up to Paradox because Paradox level 99 can defeat him, but he just comes back through Mario warp pipes, apparently. Uh, but also, level 0 allows him to drain the levels of anybody, any other writer he's touching, which I think is really cool. Um, also, I love how Poppy just has control over him, where she can just like, throw out Dan Carrito into battle, um, which is just so interesting. But also keeping him in check is tricky. But by the end of this episode, he kind of realized that it's better to help uh, Emu and friends instead of fighting against them, um, as that's going to get the end goal of taking revenge against Paradox and clearing Counter Chronicle and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I still love Paradox's suit design for Perfect Knockout Gamer. Let's just talk about how amazing that is. Um, it's just, it's beautiful. It's got the nice flowing cape. It's mixed up the um, Knockout Fighter and Perfect Puzzle heads together into one, and it just merges the two designs together. It's wonderful, and I want a figure art. I want a figure art of all of Paradox's forms. I think he's probably my favorite writer of the show, honestly, because his motivations are so good and logical in what he does, and it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense when I'm, I'm thinking about it. Um, and he's probably the most interesting character in the show as well. Um, what's also kind of interesting is we had a ride player this episode that was an, an older woman who wanted to um, be able to protect her son, I believe, and that was kind of an interesting plot plot point that doesn't really get explored, but it's the kind of idea that there are some people out there who are like, oh, this, this game is dangerous and can hurt, you know, people I love. I'm going to fight it and try to beat it, even though I don't have the strength. I'm going to do so anyways. But that was really great. Um, Also, Nico for the win. I love Nico in this episode. Um, There's been a debate lately if Nico is a writer or not, and I say yes. Ride player N is Kamen Rider Nico. That is the answer, and I want a figure art. Please, Bandai, make it happen. I will buy it. Same with Poppy. Make those two, and I'll be really happy. But yeah, uh, basically, a lot of great stuff. Um, I love how Dan Carudo is just handing out presents at the end of the episode, and he's like, oh, here you go, Emu. Here's Dora Mifa Beats token. 
here you go, um, Taiga, here's an extra Gashat Gear duel. I'm like, yes, finally we can have Tattle Fantasy and Bang Bang Simulations. And then um, here Nico have candy. And here Brave just say, no, like, your girlfriend might not be dead anymore if we finish this game. But yeah, this is a great episode because it it established Dan Caruto and his new existence as a backup secondary writer hero. Um, but you know what's interesting is the, the transformation of Emu into x and Dan Caruto into Gim reminded me so much of Yamato and um, Bado in Juo Oger with uh, Juo Eagle and, and uh, Juo Bird. It was so interesting because like, they're both the same color, and they have they're they they're both the same suit with different colors, and they both do similar poses. Now, of course, I can't praise X Eight all the time. I have to complain about it somewhat. Um, X Eight needs a new base suit, please. I hate looking at pink and green. I'm sorry for those that like it. I don't like X Eight Mighty Action X. Nah, it's okay. Um, honestly, I've gotten used to it at this point. Thirty one episodes into the show, I better get used to it. Um, it's just kind of how it is, but. One thing I do complain about is that Kamen Rider Poppy is really underused. Um, every time she's fighting, she kind of gets knocked back. Um, she was really powerful when she was evil, but now that she's good, she's still cute. I like her, but Nico is more effective. And Nico's just running around with a basic Kamen Rider Chronicle gash at. And Poppy has a bug visor plus a Tokimeki crisis. I, I really want them to do more with her. I get that she can't, like, nobody can outshine the main writer. That's, like, the unforeseen rule, the unspoken rule. Unfortunately for Emu, um, Paradox, Gem, Kiria, Taiga, Hiro, Nico, all outshine Emu. So at this point, why not just let Poppy join the lineup? So, anyways, that's x Uh, Really looking forward to next week with the debut of Kamen Rider Kronos. Um, who we still don't know who he is, and I would love it. I would really love it if we don't find out his identity next week. But I know that this is a Toei production, so I don't want to get my hopes up too much. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Switching gears, the show I talk a lot about, Kamen Rider Amazons Season 2. When this season's... When, when Amazon Season 2 was even announced, I was very concerned. Because I was worried that Amazon season two would be a pale imitation of the original. Wouldn't follow up on the. It wouldn't follow up on the successful storytelling of the original, and overall just kind of be, just mediocre. It wouldn't be as good in comparison. They may maybe try and take it a step darker, and then it's not working. I don't know what is happening here, but Amazon season two has become a more compelling drama show, and has become way more interesting than season one was, especially at the middle point in the series. Season one was very compelling at the beginning and the end, like where Sigma appeared. But in the middle, it was kind of there. Um, the Amazon Season 2 is very compelling, and they're not slowing down the plot. They have a lot more to accomplish here, a lot more characters to work with. Um, and yet, nobody seems to be getting sidelined. Everybody serves their purpose, and it doesn't feel like any characters are underdeveloped, um, which is really nice. But this episode had a great fight scene between Amazon Neo and the Crow Amazon against the Evolved Mole Amazon and Kamen Rider Amazon Omega. So, really cool stuff. Um, it's definitely a case of, of Haruka's wanting to kill EU because of what starry state she's in, but Chihiro doesn't want that, that that happen. So, it's kind of like an interesting situation there, uh, which is a good dynamic, I think, to work with. Um, what What's really nice about this season is that, despite being darker, it's still really fun to watch. And it's like... I think they got away from that really grotesque kind of stuff they were doing in the beginning of the season with, like, EU's family being eaten. That was like, oh, I still get chills. And they showed it every once in a while, and just, like, it disturbs me. Like, I like I think it should. But uh, the Amazon murders are not as, as gruesome anymore, even though the last couple of episodes have been about cutting heads off. Um, it, it's just been, it's been kind of interesting because they're not doing, like, a practical effect head shop. They're doing a very, uh, they're using CG. Um, which makes it not as believable, which I think is okay. I think that works to it. Um, but it's interesting this episode because um, each character kind of goes through a different stage of growth. Mamaru is having trouble um, 
with his biological systems not working because he's not eating people. Um, and he's wanting to fight back, but Haruka is realizing that he will help protect Mamoru, but Mamoru doesn't necessarily want that protection. Mamoru wants them, wants Haruka to fight for them, uh, which is, you know, follow their cause. But Haruka doesn't agree that turning people into Amazons is good. So he's agreed to to fight against the the human Amazons when they attack people. Um, and any Amazon that will attack people is is going to be his enemy. Um, which I think is 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 really cool. Um, we also saw a collaboration between Haruka and the old extermination team again. Um, they've agreed to work together to eliminate the new Amazons. Meanwhile, the 4C team did not actually kill that woman from last week. She was just shot. Um, she's in the hospital. She's in ICU. Her evil uh, boyfriend Amazon, the Rose Amazon, still cop- chopping heads. Um, but it's interesting that they use her as a trap because they figure that he'll show up again. But then they're not so certain. Um, what this is interesting is leads to is <laughs> the most shocking moment of this was that um, the, the captain commander of the, um, of this splinter extermination squad is there on the, uh, stakeout waiting for the Rose Amazon to appear again. This guy's played by Time Fire from Time Ranger, um, and he gets killed in this episode. And I was like, oh, great, Time Fire dies in all timelines. Um, in both in stupid ways, too. That's the thing. <laughs> um, he just steps out of a car and gets his head chopped, and... It's, it's very CG. Also, what's interesting is the head rolled backwards this time instead of popping off and flying with momentum. And yet there was still, like, a shower of blood. Um, what's kind of twisted is that this Amazon goes in and his girlfriend's like, oh, we were going to be happy together and be able to go get married. And she was like, well, I'm going to die, so you might as well eat me. I was like, Whoa. That's some sacrifice. She really loved him. It's kind of sad. Um, to wrap this storyline up, uh, basically, Haruka and Chihiro work together to defeat the Rose Amazon, and in a wonderful twist of irony, uh, they chop his head off. Which I think was, like, the perfect end of the storyline, because, yeah, guy's been chopping a lot of heads lately, and that's how he gets killed. Um, which I thought was thought was really interesting. But that whole storyline with the Rose Amazon, kind of showed that, you know, even though she, you know, this this woman was chopping heads for her boyfriend so he could continue to live as an Amazon because he, you know, felt the temptation to eat human flesh, was she doing it to keep herself alive, or did she really love him that much? And I was kind of, like, thinking that at first, like, last week, I was like, maybe she was just doing this to keep herself safe. She's like, oh, I'll bring you flesh, don't eat me. Um... But now seeing this episode where she kind of sacrificed himself for him, that showed that she was really in love with him, and that was a, a true love situation. So that was really interesting. That was like probably one of the most interesting plots we've had in an Amazon uh, episode. Um, but yeah, that was the Rose Amazon was definitely a cool design, um, and a definitely an interesting storyline. Um, also inconsistent head chopping. Hopefully next week nobody's head get cut off. That would be nice. Um, <laughs> kind of sick of it at this point. Um, but yeah, let's talk about other characters. So we got Hiroshi, uh, who's the new kid, um, the kid that's joined the extermination team. He's out of the hospital, but he's on crutches because, you know, he got attacked by Amazons. And he's kind of pissed that they're just, that the extermination team isn't trying harder to kill Amazons. Um, what's awesome is that Shihiro and Hiroshi get to, or Hiroki, sorry, not Hiroshi, Hiroki, um, the two of them finally get to reunite. They literally cross paths on the street. Um, and... Yeah, so Hiroki and Shiro get to reunite, which they started the season hunting Amazons. And they were playing it as a game. And they have this great conversation where they talk about, like, and, and Hiroki's like, I would have never started hunting Amazons if I had known like, who they were, what happened, or what would this lead to, because two of, one of his friends is a dead Amazon, and the other friends got eaten by an Amazon, <laughs> like, he's, um, he, he realizes now that, that doing this thing that, that made them money, 
was hunting Amazons and posting videos of it on the internet, made the money, but it was not worth it in the end. The sacrifice was too much, uh, which is like, that, that's pretty heartbreaking. Um, to, especially this actor is so good at, at controlling that rage and anger and making a good performance out of it. Um, but basically, the water source um, comes from the original Amazon. Um, they're just calling him the original, and that's it. Uh, but apparently Mamoru used more than just an arm, has more than just the arm of the original. Uh, so the original is not Takayama Jin, Amazon Alpha. Uh, so my speculation from last week is incorrect. Uh, but the original is the original Amazon. That's the body that cells are going into the ground to pollute the water source. Interesting things in this episode was that Fuku and Mizuki got to have a conversation about why they're on this Four Seas extermination team, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. It wasn't too too uh, eye-opening, but I thought that was kind of nice. They're kind of like, here we're season one characters in a room full of season two guys. Um, so, kind of interesting. Um, also, what's kind of cool to see is the two extermination teams and the two Amazon writers plus the Crow Amazon all working together. Um which was very interesting to see, uh, just all of them hunting down the Rose Amazon. It's a huge crowd of people, um, all hunting. So that was kind of nice, because, like, they didn't lose. Um, but it was really nice how, like, the tag team coordination between Chihiro and EU, which throughout the episode, Chihiro is trying to get EU to remember things. I'll kind of talk about that in a minute, but um, it's interesting to see that they just used the same attack pattern as last time. Um, which doesn't really gain them much success. It isn't really until Haruka appears that they're able to overcome the Amazon. Um, what's interesting about the end of this episode, though, is that um, Haruka is seeing Iyu in this state, and that Haruka had visited Iyu's father before, and that that's why he was there the night that her father ate everybody. So it's possible that Haruka knew that Iyu's father was was an Amazon. And he's so sad to see Iyu in the state of being a, a, a dangerous zombie instead of being alive or being dead. Um, this fluctuating state. And so he decides to, to end it, to, to kill Iyu, because that would be better for her. But he gets stopped. He gets stopped by a very likely source, I guess, in the end. It's Chihiro. And Chihiro is showing signs of his Amazon DNA, which I don't think is a good thing. Um, he's got blue eyes, too, which is a nice twist. But he stops he stops Haruka from, from killing Iyu, because Chihiro definitely cares for Iyu and wants to get her her human side back. And that's his whole motivation through this episode. It turns out Hiroki had known Iyu when she was in school and she was still alive. Um, and that she liked to bake cakes. So Haruka tries to bring her a cake. And he ends up smushing it in her face. Which was the funniest scene we've gotten in this whole show. And it was so interesting to see. And I, I thought that it's, it's Chihiro is trying so hard. And I don't think he'll ever succeed. Like, Iyu remembered that things were fun, but it's not like she experienced joy of it. She remembers what fun is, but she doesn't have fun anymore. It's really kind of sad. Um, there's a lot of possible tragedy with this show, but I think it's handling it well to not be overwhelmed. Also, we didn't get it. The episode did not end with some crazy, like, fight scene. It kind of, the fight ended... A cake got thrown on the face of Eu, um, and then the. What's also interesting is that the original had Amazon cells before the mutation, and they match Chihiro's, which means Chihiro and the original are connected somehow biologically. So that just opens up a whole other thing, and then the theme song kicks in. Um, the thing that makes me most excited about this episode is our big cliffhanger was that. I thought I was like, oh my god, Chihiro and the original are biologically connected somehow? That's insane. And then they have this shot of a man wearing a hood and a poncho walking through the rain. And I'm like, oh hey, hey, who is this? 
Who is this mysterious man? Oh, look at that. It's Jin. I can only see the bottom half of his face, but it's Jin. Because the episode preview also shows Takayama Jin, Kamen Rider Amazon Alpha, returns, finally, in episode, like, seven of the season. <laughs> I have been waiting so long to see him come back, and I'm really interested to see how this is going to work out. Especially now that Jin is blind. So... Really good episode this week. I think that Amazon's... I think the second season of Amazon's kind of started out a little rough and just really fell into where it was going to sit. And this is, like, where it's going to be. And I'm really liking it. I am really liking it, which is so bad for my bank account. But I'm really liking it, and I'm wanting figure arts, and I can't wait to get my Amazon Neo driver in... Uh, October, I think, is when it comes. Yeah, October. I have to wait till October. I have to wait till October. Anyways, I can't wait to see the rest of the show. By far, out of all four of the Tokusatsu series that come out on a weekly basis, I'm most excited for Amazons, followed by Q-Ranger, followed by X-Aid, followed by Kyori Brave. Um, that may change, but those are the four. I was like, Amazons are like the thing I'm most excited for. But there are some times, like, I was having a pretty down day this week where I was just not feeling great. I was feeling kind of depressed. I was like, I'm not going to watch Amazons. I'm liking, looking forward to this, but don't watch Amazons when you're depressed. Also, I do not recommend binge-watching Amazons. Watch two episodes at most at a time. Give yourself the break in time you need. Um, I think the reason why they didn't do this like a Netflix show and put up all episodes at once was because it gets kind of intense when you're watching it. Um, I did a rewatch of season one recently, and I watched like two or three episodes at a time, and it was like... <sighs> I need to breathe, I need to get away from the show. Um, personally, for me, I'd say if you're going to watch Amazon's, uh, watch one episode a day at most, um, maximum two. Uh, unless you're just cold hard inside and can just burn through it, then good for you, have fun. Um, but, man, Amazon's is a good show. I really like it. So let me know what you think of this week's Tokyo shows in the comments below, and let me know if toy collecting is stressing you out as it is stressing me out. But that also could be because I have... Just too much to collect, and I need to pare it down. But at the same time, it's like I don't want to collect, stop collecting DC Multiverse because I collect, I've collected DC figures for years now, and I have a huge collection that I'm adding to. And I don't want to stop collecting the uh, the uh, Sentai Mecha because I I got a whole huge collection of that. I've been building my entire life. Um, but even between just those two, it's still a lot. Anyways, that is all for this week on the Soundcast. Stay tuned for next week, which we'll be reaching our milestone episode of episode 20. Um, pretty impressed I've kept the series as consistent this far. Um, so definitely look forward to that next Friday. We'll also be talking about Heisei Rider Generations, as well as Jew Oger vs. Ninja, in addition to this week in Toku. Probably not an opinion spot next week, because I've got two movies to review, plus four episodes of a show, so we'll see how it goes. Um, overall... Super happy with uh, with shows this week. I like how we're in a good spot with Tokyo, where I'm enjoying all four shows um, to several extents. And eventually Ninja Steel will come back, and we'll start reviewing that. Um, I guess it's a little bit pre-early of a thing, but once Ninja Steel comes back, I'm planning on reviewing those episodes on a weekly basis as well. So, anyways, till next time, this is Sanat saying goodbye. <laughs>